So there is a reading today, but that's coming later. I don't know if we could have the first slide up. That's terrific. Thank you. So today, final, final sermon on repentance. You'll be, perhaps be glad to hear. This is actually the fifth one going from the Lord's Prayer, but I, that's probably the last time I mention the Lord's Prayer today. I want us to look at repentance in the real world, like in where we actually find ourselves. We're looking at the Old Testament example of David, particularly, and how his life went. So big focus, repentance in the real world. And starting with two questions, the first one is this, you can see, are are true Christians, you know, real, genuine Christians, are they capable of sinning often? And the second one is this. The same people, are they capable of sinning terribly? Or is it like, oh, I'm a Christian now, that doesn't happen? Well, realistically... The answer is yes and yes. Tragically, it is often yes and yes. Real Christians do sometimes sin, often, can be caught in almost a season of badness, or could be sinning terribly, or put the two together. To be clear, I'm not saying, oh, sin's fine. Sin is never fine, never okay, but the reality is sometimes a true Christian, frankly, any one of us. Some that have seemed like the best Christians have fallen terribly. Sometimes a true Christian, any one of us, by the law of averages, there'll be a number of people in this room in exactly these situations. They are now, today, sinning often, They are sinning terribly, and they know it, and they're sat here right now going, yeah, that's me. Sinning and sinking more and more. It can seem a bit like this. No, some would say that's a nice car. You've got nice wheels. Some would say, right. Imagine this car is your life. Often it's like we've made a shocking car crash of the life that God has given us. A shocking car crash. We go spinning off the road of this life and now we are stuck in a ditch. Doing what we can, you know, revving the engine, the tires are spinning. We're just going further in the ditch and we're sinking. Now what can possibly be done? What must be done? Is there anything in the Bible that can help us navigate between the rapids of right and wrong here. And one of the most helpful examples in the Bible is King David. Champion of God's people. It's the David and Goliath. David It's that guy. And he's, to be clear, King David is one of the greatest leaders God's people has ever had. Ever. He leads God's people into multiple victories, into a time of peace and prosperity, to the true worship of the living God for decades. And even in our Bibles, we can see how God worked through David's life in what David himself wrote. The Psalms. Now, that is a big old book in the Bible. You know, if I I open my Bible in the middle... It's nearly always the Psalms. I've got Proverbs, as it turns out. But it's <laughs> very close. <sighs> close, close, close. They're the Psalms, roughly, roughly middle. Now, of those 150 Psalms, David wrote 75. Some would say 73, but two more are attributed to him as well. So, 75. Now, I don't know what your maths is like, but that's half, right? 75 out of 100. He wrote half the Psalms. To be more exact, the Holy Spirit worked so wonderfully and perfectly through David's personality and abilities to write 75 out of 150 of the Psalms. 
in this book, and they are kept in this book. And David wrote them himself under the inspiration of the Spirit. What a guy. What a believer in God. What a leader of God's people. But look what he did. Look what he did. Let's have a look. So, if you turn in your Bibles to 2 Samuel, it's on page 314 in these. 2 Samuel chapter 11. I think most of you will know about David and Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite, but we'll go through some of the gears anyway. It's a good reminder. So King David, what a wonderful example of how God works terrifically through a person, but also how every person has feet of clay. I do not want my mistakes up on that screen or my sins, and you probably don't want yours either. Feet of clay. We are not perfect. King David, wow, it's amazing how bad it got. So 2 Samuel chapter 11, and we'll just skip through some of these verses. So from verse 2, one evening David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, beautiful Bathsheba, and David sent someone To find out about her, the man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Well, it doesn't bother David, because verse 4, then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. And if you go on to verse 14, I mean, David's tried to make it right, but he he hasn't managed to, so he sees the only option is to murder the husband to try and cover his tracks. So here we go, verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. This guy, he's taken his own death warrant. He doesn't realize In it, he wrote, put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. And then you get to verse 26. Uriah does die, and the news comes down. Verse 26, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Feels like an understatement. Displeased the Lord. So David fell into the deepest of ditches of his own making, and the reason was his own lusts. It's what he wanted. He wanted beautiful Bathsheba, who was another man's wife, and then David wanted, he exhausted all the other possibilities, so David wanted to get rid of the husband, Uriah, and so David was guilty of two massive things, adultery and murder, and it's, it's like he wrote the car off. He's made an appalling car crash of his life. And then what happened? Well, keep your Bibles open. Should have said that before. 2 Samuel 12. We read on from verse 1. And what we'll see here is God sends, graciously sends Nathan to David. The prophet Nathan approaches David about his adultery with Bathsheba, about the murder of Uriah And Nathan does it so carefully, almost shrewdly. He tells David this story about a shocking injustice, about this this poor man and his precious little lamb, and then the villain in the story, the rich man, who slaughters that lamb. 
So here's Nathan's story, chapter, chapter 12. It's, uh, there's David's ditch. He's, he's written his cars in the ditch. And Nathan graciously sent. So here we go, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, Nathan said, so Nathan tells this story about the poor man and the rich man. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich and the other was poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler, enter the traveler. A traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking, like he didn't take one of his own sheep or cattle, to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him, as in he slaughtered that lamb. So that's Nathan's story. David's response is so interesting in verse 5. And it's it's just mad, really. David... Burned with anger. David, who has just, you know, committed adultery and caused someone's murder, he's now, you know, righteous indignation. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, that man who did this deserves to die. Wow. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. It's you. Right there, Nathan exposes the truth that David is just like the rich man, just like the villain in the story, like the slaughterer in the story. In fact, he's worse. He's done worse. David's in this ditch of his own making. And what can he do? Because Uriah is dead. And that is David's fault. Bathsheba is pregnant. She is shamed. In a way, she is ruined. And that is David's fault. And it's all because of David's lusts. The damage from David is catastrophic. And it's, it's irreversible. And some of this happens to us in our lives. Some of the damage we do can go along similar lines. Now let's, let's be honest. For us as well, there is, there is no magic wand in this life to make it all better again. There's no reset button. We just press it and it's like, well, let's just go back to the start and we'll just do that again. Some of the damage we do Oh, well, I don't know how it is for you, but sometimes I wish there was a reset button and I could just rewind and go back and do it differently. You may have realized, or I've, I've certainly realized, your life is not a game with a reset button. Some of the damage that we do, painfully, some of us know it, but some of the damage we do, it stays with us in some form for the rest of our lives. Now, certainly we should strive to make things as right as we can in our own strength. There's a level of that. And certainly someone like David, had he not been the, the darling of the people, this amazing king that everybody adored, he really should have paid for his crimes right there and then. But he's the king, they love him, it didn't happen. But God sets up the way things are in our country, that we should pay for our crimes. Some of the damage we do lives with us for the rest of our lives. When when we drop something like a nuclear bomb into the lives of others, 
we can't expect and we know we, we can't always put things back together. It's, it's a bit of a Humpty Dumpty situation, if you will. We can't, they can't put him back together, can they? Neatly and nicely and, oh, with a nice little bow and everything's fine again. And David, keep looking at 2 Samuel 12. I've got another verse for you there. David's going to feel the sting of the consequences like we often do. We sometimes feel the sting of the consequences of our own actions down the years. Some of those things don't get undone in this life. So look at 2 Samuel 12, verse 10. David is told, Now, therefore, because of what he's done, the sword will never depart from your house. Because, God says, you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. Every sin is connected back to God because he owns everything, cares about everything. And so the sin against Uriah, Bathsheba is ultimately against God. So God says, you despised me to do such a thing. As a consequence of David's sin, the sword will never depart from your house, which means there's going to be much violence in his family. In David's dynasty. Here's an image for you. Imagine a family tree, a family tree, a tree. Well, this one is going to be covered in blood. The sword will not, never depart from your house. And to read on through the Bible, you see that that happens through Amnon, through Absalom, and after Solomon's life. The problems continue and worsen much death. Now, what about today? Right in Derby today, when you become a Christian, when you become a Christian, and also as a Christian, we can cause a lot of damage, similar to David. And there's no, don't you just wish there was a magic wand or there's a reset button? But there isn't one. There isn't a, a reset that makes everything right and rosy. Like, oh, everything's brilliant again and we're all skipping down the valley. Sometimes it doesn't happen. We wish it did. Some of the damage that, that you did, that I did, it might be impossible to sort, to resurrect, to bring life. In the, I mean, how many years have you got left? In the years that we have left, sometimes it's just not long enough to make things right. And for David, well, Uriah is dead. How are you going to make that right? He couldn't. Sins have consequences. State the obvious, sins have consequences. Let me give you two examples. For example, so you may become a Christian. But, but historically, or even as a Christian, you might do this. You gamble. I saw, I went into a, I went into a Weatherspoons early morning to drink my coffee, right? And they've got these gambling machines. And there's three people, this is like before nine o'clock, and they're going on the gambling machines. And I'm looking at one of them, and it says like 65 quid. And every time he presses the button, 64, 63, 62. This is a huge problem in our society, gambling. Now, you may find that you have gambled your life savings away. What's going to happen then? You gambled your life savings away. Well, that money is not coming back into your bank account. And some of the people whose money you borrowed... Or you blagged it and said, oh, I'm desperate for a thousand pounds. Some of those people aren't going to trust you again. They may never trust you again in this life. Sin has consequences. I'll give you another example. This is a friend of mine. Um, a, in my estimation, a wonderful Christian man, in my estimation, for what that's worth. 
Now, before he was a Christian, for about 20 years, he used recreational drugs, who many people want to legalize. Like, oh, yeah, that's, that'll, be, that'll be fine for society. Right, okay. But anyway, he became a Christian after 20 years of drug use, and there are irreversible consequences for what he did. Wonderfully, he is so hungry for the Bible, but sadly, he can barely concentrate for more than five minutes because his brain's all over the place because he wrecked it. It's like he threw his brain in the microwave and put it on for a couple of minutes. He is fried by all the drugs. He did it to himself. There's no magic wand to get his brain back. There's no, there's no reset. Now, I could leave it there, and it would be very, very depressing. But there is hope for all of us. Absolutely everyone in this room, there is hope. Whatever di- ditch we find ourselves in, God is willing to provide a way out of any ditch the main thing to be right with your God for all eternity and to be blessed forever in his land, that's the big thing. And the way out sounds so simple. It is repentance. It is turning from our sin to turning living wholeheartedly for the living God. And for my friend who, it's like he put his brain in the microwave, for that guy, a true repenter, ultimately, he is going to spend eternity in the paradise of God with a brilliant brain, better than he ever had here, in his right mind. So there is hope for each one of us in Christ, truly turning from our sin to the Lord. And look at David in 2 Samuel 12. There it is again. 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. David repents. He's in that ditch, but he repents. Look at this. So 2 Samuel 12, verse 13. Then David said to Nathan, this is his repentance. I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. It's a new day. David repents. David is forgiven. But there's there's more detail to this repentance in Psalm 51. So please turn to Psalm 51. It's on page 573. A Psalm of David at this precise juncture in his life. And here we get, in Psalm 51, we get raw words of repentance. David knows he's far too bad. He's done too much to solve it himself. How could he possibly solve this? It's too bad. He is grieved by his sin, by the damage, by the disgrace. And he reaches out to the only place he can go. To the God who delights to show mercy. That is a brilliant verse in the Bible, by the way. It's uh, Micah, just for reference, it's Micah 7, verse 18. tells us that God delights to show mercy. God delights. He's not begrudgingly showing mercy. God delights to show mercy. Micah 7, 18. But anyway, Psalm 51. David cries out to God. David, David knows he's the problem here. He's not kind of saying, well, you know, my childhood was a bit like this and uh, I had some bad situations and there was just a lot of temptation around. No, no, no. He knows he's the problem. So he says, have mercy on me, O God. This is what God's like. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. But again, David knows he's the problem. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, the great God, against you have I sinned 
and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are, you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Now, we'll not read any more now on that particular psalm. But here we have it. David's sin has been exposed publicly. And in this psalm, we have one of the greatest examples of repentance in the whole Bible. Because he's, he's come out of that situation and, he, and he's saying, I am the problem. I need God's unfailing love and compassion and mercy. That's my only hope. I need the one who's going to wash me, cleanse me, blot out this sin. And he's doing some good stuff in Psalm 51. David, he, he sees that it is his sin, it is his ditch, his damage. To stay in a ditch too long, it, it ends up being your grave. But David makes sure, as, as God is working through him, that he repents and he doesn't stay in that ditch. He knows that he is the problem. He's not shifting the blame to anyone else or anything else. It's my sin, my transgressions, my iniquity. But wonderfully, he sees his God. He sees his God who delights to show mercy. Turns to his God in great sorrow for the only way out. And he repents. And so, God enables David to get out of the ditch. We see, or we have seen, where he was told by Nathan, the Lord has taken away your sin. Now, back in Derby, 2023, here we are. Does that kind of stuff still happen today amongst true believers? Can real Christians really sin that badly? Some of the worst crimes. Well, tragically, it can happen. But there's a there's a really important distinction. This is from an old pastor of mine. It says it like this. Not Andrew Knox, just in case you were, because he's a current pastor, right? But an old pastor of mine said this. We are all, just when we think, oh, well, he's talking about other people. No, no, no. We are all capable. Let's not be overconfident and just think, oh, you know, I'm bulletproof. Nothing's going to get in. Don't be so naive. We are all capable of falling into sin, even very great sin. But there is a great deal of difference. Here's the thing, the distinction. There's a great deal of difference between falling into a ditch and living in one. So here's the thing. For the fake Christian who in the final analysis will never truly be saved, but they might turn up to our church services or call themselves a Christian, but never come to church. For the fake Christian, they are able to live in a ditch. They are able to do that, to live, which would mean to live with their sin of choice till the day they die, and often, quite comfortably, maybe with great enjoyment in their sin, sometimes publicly, proudly, even within the church. And over time, they, the fake Christian who is never in the end truly saved, they can learn to ignore their conscience, silence it, gradually disconnect the God-given conscience Ignore the clear teachings of the Bible. And Paul warns us about this in 1 Corinthians 6 on the screen. Paul warns us about these lifestyles of sin. Not just, oh, sometimes we sin, but no, this is shaping me. This is who I am. This is my, in modern language, this is my identity. Do you not know, Paul? the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth, which was seriously messed up, so he has to remind them, do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. 
neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now you might think that's got nothing to do with you, but virtually every person who's lived on the face of the earth has been an idolater, has put something in the place of God as more important than God in certain situations. But the problem here is a fixed lifestyle where those kinds of things dominate. Not just that you might do it, but it's like, no, this is, this is you now. This shapes you. Please heed the warning. A settled lifestyle of sin is deadly. Ditch, ditch life is deadly. Like I've said already, that the ditch, if you remain there, becomes a very grave situation, even your grave. These patterns of life strongly suggest that you are not a Christian. And therefore, in verse 9, verse 9, Paul says that these kinds of people will not inherit the kingdom of God. And that's the implication at the end of verse 10 as well about the kingdom of, of God. Now, in the Old Testament, comparing David, there is another king that would fit better in with 1 Corinthians 6 of a lifestyle of sin, King Saul. King Saul, he started out very well. He seemed like a strong believer, one of God's leaders, living for the Lord. But Saul, got, he got in a ditch of his own making, different from David. So Saul allowed rage and jealousy to overrun his life. It's like the walls came down, a bit like the walls of Jericho, and he just got overrun with this. So Paul was in, sorry, Saul, Saul, this guy was in a ditch, and it, it may have seemed a bit like David. You know, he's, there are some bad sins going on, but the key difference, David repented, and he got, he got out. He had peace with God. Saul, on the other hand, seems like he refused to repent. He held on to his jealousy and rage. His ditch became his grave. Now, having said all that, I have to tell you, there is a small amount of debate about where King Saul ended up. I find this surprising myself. It kind of, the evidence seems to point that he's not ending up in a good place. But there is some debate as to whether Saul is saved and in heaven. But what we know of Saul, the pattern of Saul's later life, how he finishes is very dodgy, it's very dark, and it's a dangerous pattern to follow. I would never say, oh yeah, you need to be like King Saul. Be like him, how he finished. No way. He did not finish well. If you ever get the chance today to read the end of 1 Samuel chapter 31, and you see how Saul ended up, it's a complete disgrace, it's an absolute tragedy. We must be on our guards. Beware the settled lifestyle of sin, living in a ditch. After this life, there are no second chances. I don't know what you've heard on the telly, or what you've read in a book, but there are no second chances before the judgment seat of God in the next life. And we read again in 1 Corinthians 6, do you not know? Don't you know? The wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then there are all those examples. That is not a full list. There's just some initial examples. To be absolutely straight with you, to be straight, being comfortable with your sin and really enjoying it and not being bothered suggests very loudly you are not a Christian. The true believer cannot live like that for very long. And I'm telling you that 
Because the true believer is a temple of the Holy Spirit. That means the God of all things, who is holy, 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 somehow lives in you by the Spirit. And so, you think, well, if the Spirit's in you, how can you persist in sin for your whole life as a settled pattern? I would say you can't. For the true Christian, even though you still do sin, Sometimes often, sometimes terribly. Nevertheless, because the Holy Spirit is in you, when you sin, over time, you just can't live with, you can't live with the sin. You become, some of you will know this, you become restless. You become unsettled. You are disturbed by your sin. You are often grieved. How could I do this? Jesus died for me. And how could I repay him with this kind of lifestyle? As a true child of God, you cannot go on living in a ditch because the Holy Spirit is at work in you. So eventually, you fight sin. You just go, no. You fight sin. And sometimes we fight sin very well. Sometimes... We don't fight sin very well. We are certainly not perfect. But the key thing for the Christian is at some point you fight. You fight sin. That's the vital thing. A life of repentance means you fight sin in you while you still have life in you. That is the Christian way. We fight. In conclusion, from David's life and in Psalm 51, we can see true believers... Today, that genuine Christians can sin terribly. It can happen. We can make a car crash of our lives, and we can be sinking in a ditch for quite some time. But in the end, we refuse to stay there. As God works through us. Now, to try and help out, to get us thinking really about us, Perhaps you're in a ditch right now. You're in a ditch. There are some sinful lifestyle choices that are just creeping in from that list. But also, let me give you some other examples from David's life. Just lusts creeping in. And we're, we're not preventing them. We're, we're allowing ourselves to drift to places, to situations, to feed it. The lusts creeping in. Bitterness gossip, laziness, and then the other side of it, self-righteousness. Or something really awful like David, like what he did. Now with eternity at stake on what we do before a holy God, please do not allow your ditch to be your grave. So we don't want to get in line with King Saul. We do want to get in line with King David. Repent, resolve to fight sin again and again. Right, I'm not a boxer, right? Okay, you probably guess right. But as we're fighting, yeah, not, not a boxer, right? But as you're fighting sin, be assured the Holy Spirit gives power to every punch. You are not fighting on your own. You have this one life, You've, your life is God given. He's given you this life. And what are we going to do with it? Well, I want to get in line with King David on how he turned things around in God's strength. I want the final note of my life to be something like what they said about David in the New Testament. This, this is extraordinary. When you think of what David did, adultery, murder, they're two of the worst things you can ever do, adultery and murder. The consequences that flow from these things are awful. Now, I don't know how, how bad you think you are. Probably not as bad as that. Probably haven't done those things. But despite all of that, what David is known for 
is not the ditch life, but the devoted life. That's the final note on his life. I mean, it's astonishing what God can do with our mess, with our disgrace. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, who by the Holy Spirit wrote 13 books in the New Testament, letters that we know as books. What is, this is what he says about David. And it's really God's words on David. So Paul says, After removing Saul, as in King Saul, God made David their king. God testified concerning David. God says this, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, I want to get in line with that David. I don't want to get in line with King Saul. I want to get in line with that David and say, this, with, I want to be in line with that. Because David's in line with the Lord at this point. And in the end, I mean, you want your life to count for something, right? In the end, may God say this of you. I don't know what your track record is, but despite your track record... What's your worst sin? Do you want to shout it out? No, you don't. What's your, what are your worst sins? Despite all of that, the stench of all of that, and my sins, what a steaming pile that is. It's horrific. Despite all of that, God can turn this around for us, and we can get a write-up like David, someone like David, A person after God's own heart, devoted, all in with the Lord. And from that verse, you see, David would do everything that God wants him to. May we be those who are in this book and saying, Lord, I want to do everything you want me to. Which will include repenting, resolving to live for the Lord. Not defined by the ditch life, but the devoted life. Let's pray. Gracious God, you know each one of us. You know what we're up to. You know the good things we're doing. You know the bad things we're doing. And Lord, we ask for your help We ask that you would refine us to be better for you, to live holier lives for you. And Lord, for those who are really struggling today with sin and they feel like they're losing, Lord, help them to win. Help them to win battles and to to ask for help from their brothers and sisters in this room. And help them to pray and know your strength specifically one temptation at a time. Amen. Amen. Right, in response to what